I am Ben Sugar. I am the senior trail builder with the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. And you are hopefully here for rigging for trail work. Um, and so uh, I have a hard time remembering who's attended these uh, webinars before with me or otherwise. Uh, so in case anyone is, <clears throat> is just waking up from a long Rip Van Winkle sleep and hasn't uh, mastered Zoom yet, um, in order to participate, uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat um, or raise your hand uh, anytime during the presentation. And I'll, I'll often uh, stop a couple times during and uh, <clears throat> ask if anyone has any questions or comments. Um, and uh, another thing is we count attendance. Um, and so we get a sense for who's coming to these things. Uh, if you could just type your name out in the chat and that way, um, when we process the chat log, uh, we'll have a record of it. Otherwise, someone would have to just watch the whole thing just to see who is here. So if you guys could do that just uh, sometime in the next couple of minutes, that would be great. All right, there we go. So just some uh, housekeeping items before we get started um, and to allow for maybe a couple other folks to show up late. I uh, just want to give a quick uh, thank you shout out to uh, Liberty Subaru, um, who uh, made a donation to fund um, continuing trail uh, workshops and webinars. And so they're helping make this possible. So I wanted to thank them. Um, this is being recorded to the cloud and will be available on our website. Um, we have a webinar uh, trail learning library, probably biffed the name of that. It's named something else, but close enough. Uh, you should find this there, along with many other uh, fantastic webinars that we've been doing uh, ever since uh, 2020 got real. Um, so uh, after this, uh, I will look, uh, as soon as possible, send out a supplementary um, document or documents with additional readings and sources that you can, um, uh, that you can, uh, check and, and read and avail yourself of if you would like to learn more than you can in roughly an hour, because this is uh, quite frankly not a, a subject that gets taught in an hour usually. So um, uh, do the best I can uh, going as broad as uh, I can and as deep as makes sense. Um, <clears throat> it really does make sense to teach this sort of stuff out in the field where you can get a feel for the tools involved and the physical forces that I'm talking about. So um, at some point in the uh, unforeseen future, I do plan to follow up on this workshop as well as many others with some sort of field component and invite the people who attended to uh, attend. So we can get out in the woods, um, get dirty and, and throw some rocks around, right? Uh, so just real quick uh, in terms of what we're gonna talk about today, I'm gonna talk about rigging as a, a basic concept and discipline, what it actually is at its fundamental level um, and what, why we do it, what it accomplishes. Um, <clears throat> introduction to grip hoist winches, which are the kind of a, the go-to uh, method of rigging that we use in trail work. Um, and then talk about some of the other rigging components that we use in concert with grip hoist winches in order to make rigging happen to do things like move rocks around, um, move stringers for bridges um, and move other equipment um, in a way that we can actually accomplish out in the backcountry. Uh, we'll talk about some load calculation and how that relates to the equipment that we're using and so we can work safely. Um, and then talk about the setup and basic operation of a grip hoist and talk about uh, basic drags and use of um, kind of the, the core kit of materials and then get into a little bit of uh, talking about uh, mechan more mechanical advantage and use of pulleys to kind of use, use them as a multiplier effect. Um, and then we'll talk about some other safety considerations when operating grip hoist. What we are not gonna have time to get into today is high line operation. Uh, it's, um, I was already approaching 40 slides with this without even getting into high line. 
And I was afraid I would be pushing a hundred slides if I tried to make this include Highline, but this is the fundamentals. And I fully expect in the coming weeks to have a, uh, a follow-up to this that will focus specifically on Highlines and other more niche applications for uh, grip hoist rigging. Um, so if some, if you're here specifically for Highline, I apologize. Uh, I, I know that the, I think the description on the website mentioned that, but uh, as it turns out, it's a little too ambitious to try to fit in within an hour. I hope that's okay. All right, so uh, hopefully everyone here is familiar with the trail conference. Um, there's some volunteers down there on the bottom left. That's the staff that doesn't include me on the bottom right because that's an old picture. Um, so we've been around since 1920, it's a birthday. Uh, 100 years, uh, protecting trails and, tra and trail lands to support and advocacy and working to educate the public on uh, responsible trail use and of the natural environment so that they can persist and for people to enjoy for decades to come. Uh, here is our mission statement. You can find it on our website, I won't read it, but uh, this is me um, from a couple of years ago. Uh, I am a, my title again is Senior Trail Builder. Uh, I've been with the Trail Conference since 2018. My background is uh, I started in New England working with New Hampshire State Parks uh, in 2003 uh, along with SCA and AmeriCorps. And then I've worked for the Green Mountain Club since then as well as uh, uh, for county parks outside of Washington DC and for the Forest Service in Utah. Um, and like I said, just a couple of years ago, I uh, came back east to, to take over this job. All right, so actually let's, let's go back. Um, since there's only, what, six of you? Why, um, how about we'll, we'll just go around, if everyone's comfortable with it, just uh, fill me in a little bit on, or tell me a little bit about what your uh, interest in this topic is, and you know, by way of telling me kind of what your trail work experience and interest is. So I'll start kind of top left on my screen. Uh, Jeff, what's, uh, what interests you about this? Or you're muted, you're muted. Can you hear me? Now? Yeah, yeah. Hello. Um, I've been with the long distance trails crew. I'm in my sixth season. So all my training and experience with the High Line has been on the job training and explanations from the crew leaders, et cetera. So there's a lot of experience there, but there's never been any formal, I'll say classroom training kind of thing other than on the trail, which yeah. admittedly has been pretty good. So I'm looking to see the details, see what may be missing from my set of knowledge. Yeah, I, I promise I'll, I'll have some things in here that you're probably not aware of, but there will, you know, there will be some familiar ground for sure. All right, thanks. Um, Peter, can you unmute yourself? Hello, everyone. Um, I actually work with the same trail crew as Jeff and myself. We both uh, worked on the uh, work with the High Line and such. Part of the uh, thing I was looking in here that caught my eye was the calculations and stuff to figure out that we're doing it right and doing it safe. Okay. If we have time, I, I could field some specific questions about Highline. Um, but again, I'll, I'll devote an entire other one to that. Hi there. So who is that? Matt Smith. Welcome. Um, we're just kind of, I, we're just doing introductions and going around the room and talking about what people's uh, background is and their interest in rigging for trail. Um, so uh, I'll go next. Brian, how about you? All right. Um, I love stone. Uh, I'd like to know more about working with it. I did do a volunteer thing on the stairs on Bear Mountain uh, at one point a few years ago, and uh, I think that was Highline, which is a uh, uh, cable up in the air moving mm -hmm. big stones. Yeah, uh, I loved that too. Um, so any anything about stone? Uh, I haven't had the time or I've had a couple of uh, 
you know, broken bones or things since then and haven't been back, but yeah. I'm retired now and I've got time on my hands. Uh, I'd like to uh, get involved a little more when things start happening in the spring. All right, great. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Hi, um, I, uh, uh, similar to Brian, am very interested in moving large stones around and seeing what, how we can uh, make them, ma make trails more navigable because of it. Um, it's, uh, it's just interesting to me how we can get that done without bringing heavy equipment in there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's my interest in this particular uh, class. And in general, I am looking to get actively involved in the uh, Hudson Trails trail maintenance. All right, great, welcome. Uh, Brian. Uh, you have Hi, everybody. My, um, my name is Brian. I'm the land manager at Flat Rock Brook uh, Nature Preserve. We're in Englewood, New Jersey. Um, so I manage like about 150 acres and three and a half miles of trail. Um, most of my experience in rigging is with trees. So uh, big tree rigging and climbing. Um, so I'm curious to see how it uh, Kind of correlates in in uh, stone work and more moving stones and things. It's the weights are a little bit different. The rigging is a little more hardcore. So uh, just kind of looking to expand that. And uh, yeah, and yeah, specifically you... working with water bars um, with stone instead of the the pressure treated six by six or using both uh, yeah. sometimes. So um, yeah. Yeah, we definitely borrow some stuff from arborist rigging. Our, our belay lines use porter wraps and things like that that you'd see in, uh, in arbor culture. Uh, and so we'll talk about that along with uh, the Highline stuff unless we have some extra time. But great, glad to have you. Uh, Eric, are you there? Hi, I'm Eric. Um, I just started becoming a uh, trail maintainer uh, earlier this year. I was just mainly curious about the topic, maybe in the future. Um, Get uh get more involved with volunteering about uh doing the heavier heavy duty stuff. All right, great. And, and this is even if you never do, this is really good to see kind of what resources are are out there. And like if you've got problems on your trail, just knowing what it what it looks like when a crew comes out and breaks out the you know quote unquote big big guns. Like what is possible to do. So great, glad to have you, uh, Matt. Welcome. Hey. Uh, I'm Matt Smith. Uh, I'm a trail supervisor with the trail conference. I do about 25 miles of trails in the Catskills. Um, so in the past, I've, I've done work on the long path and, and other uh, trails, building stone staircases um, and other stone structures, uh, never using rigging, always using rock bars and uh, a lot of human power to, to move these. Uh, so yeah, I'm interested in how to uh, navigate some of these rocks a little bit easier uh, with maybe smaller crews um, and less, uh, you know, potential uh, risk risk of uh, injury. Yeah. Well, uh, as uh, an old boss of mine said a uh, decade and a half ago, it's like uh, grip hoist and rigging is isn't about um, making the work easier. It's just another way to work really hard because uh, <laughs> this stuff's heavy um, and there's there can be a lot of it. So let's just start off with what rigging is as a concept and as a word, first of all. It's one of those strange words that actually refers to several things. So it's a noun that just talks about this general discipline of uh, a type of materials handling and movement uh, over short to medium distances, typically, uh, via redirected physical force, specifically pulling forces. Because when we talk about rigging, we're almost always talking about uh, rope or wire rope or some other um, flexible strand and you don't, as you know, you don't push a rope. Uh, in fact, there's even a, I think there's an idiom about that. You pull rope. Uh, so it's all about taking the pulling force and redirecting it and focusing it. Um, and so the word rigging also is a plural noun, refers to all the pieces of gear and equipment you have to lug in and set up in order to do this work. Uh, so when you say like, yeah, you know, can you, can you, I'm gonna need you to carry in some of that rigging. That's, that's what that refers to. Uh, and it's also a verb, which is the process of carrying all that stuff in and designing a system, doing all the uh, back of your hand math for how much 
force is going to be required to do what you want to do, um, setting it up and then operating it to actually carry that work out. So um, you, you, in order to carry out rigging, you set up rigging and, and then do rigging. Uh, so it's, it's one of those things that gets applied in lots of different disciplines, sailing, uh, construction, search and rescue, which in, in arboriculture, which is both of those are a little bit more um, directly analogous because they happen in more wildland environments. Uh, but, you know, you could go on and on. So like stage and set uh, um, management for like for theater and things like that, they use rigging for the the curtains and such. Um, so it's pretty broad. Um, at its essence, rigging takes advantage of simple machines. Uh, you may remember this from maybe like middle school physics, um, where essentially most basic work and basic tools at a fundamental level use simple machines um, that employ physics that, to make work easier by concentrating and or redirecting applied force. So pulleys up there top left, uh, a lever is a big one. If you've ever moved a rock with a rock bar, that's a lever. Um, a wedge, every time you use an ax, every time you dig into the ground with a mattock, that's a wedge. Um, a wedge is just actually a kind of inclined plane. It's just that you're using it as a force. So an inclined plane makes work easier to say, push a barrel up, up a ramp. Uh, and a screw is just an inclined plane wrapped around a cylinder. So really, if you fundamentally break it down, um, a pulley is in some ways just a kind of wheel and axle, which is then just actually a kind of lever. Uh, a wedge and a screw are both just different kinds of inclined planes. Um, so the lever and the inclined plane are the most fundamental ones. And most of the tools that we use with some exceptions uh, are some sort of application of simple tools writ large. And when you are concentrating force rather than just redirecting it, you're using what's called mechanical advantage. Um, and we'll, we're gonna talk more about mechanical advantage later, but essentially a lever when you, you choke up on that rock bar and get a nice low bite on a rock, you're able to lift a heavy boulder up three inches by pushing the other end of the bar straight down three feet because you're concentrating the movement of most of that bar into the remaining two or three inches at the other end of the fulcrum. Um, does that make sense to everyone? I'm bringing this up because it's gonna come up later. Oop. So um, a grip hoist winch, so everyone's probably seen a winch on the front of a, of a truck or something like that that wraps around a drum cylinder um, or maybe a, just kind of a standard come along that you can buy just at the hardware store. Um, these are slightly different and they're um, advantageous for trail work for a number of reasons. Let's see, um, for one thing, they're completely modular. The rope is completely separate from the winch itself. You can take the rope out and roll it up separately, and therefore that makes it, you can break it into several components and makes it more portable. Um, most of the units are at least reasonably portable and lightweight. Um, the smaller ones are around 18 pounds for the actual winch, uh, and then they go up from there. The, the mid-range is about 40 pounds. Um, you operate them manually, so there's no need for a generator or gasoline. Um, and what's nice is because you put an, a kind of a naked end of wire rope in the front and it spits out the back, you can theoretically feed an unlimited amount of wire rope through. So if you need to winch something from 50 feet away, you can have a 60-foot rope. Um, if you need to winch something from 90 feet away, you can put in a 100-foot rope. Um, and all it takes is just that additional amount of physical cranking to get you there. Um, what's nice is uh, different from other manual come-alongs, it actually feeds through on the push and pull strokes. Uh, another good aspect of it is that you can, using this, let me see if I can, where is, oh, I'm not sure if my, if my mouse is showing up on this, probably not, but this, uh, 
this handle on the top is actually, that's the, uh, it is, okay. That's actually the slacking handle. So you put a handle on there and when you crank that top handle, it gradually lowers the tension and feeds the line back through in reverse. Whereas some other come alongs, you have to release it all at once and that can be extremely dangerous. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna have a couple of videos in here. Um, rather than try and set anything up in my, uh, in my basement and misangle the focus and have to be a, a video director, I thought I'd let YouTube do it for me. So just watch this. Please consult the manufacturer's guidelines and use and care instructions before beginning. Hi, I'm Pat Clark with Lifting Gear Hire Corporation. Today we're going to be discussing one of the most underutilized hoists on the market today, the grip hoist machine, also referred to as the turfer. For openers, we'd like to demonstrate for you as to how to load the wire rope into the hoist itself. It's actually a two-handed operation, so with a free hand, there's a spring load mechanism on the side, depress that, with the other hand, move one of the handles back. Simply grab the wire rope. Push it through, repeat this operation reverse, and now your hoist is engaged and ready to use. To install the handle on the stem that would allow the wire rope to pay out, simply slide it over. There's a little notch there. We'll twist the handle. That will lock into place. Pump and pay out wire rope. If you need to retract the wire rope, simply remove the handle, repeat the process on the rear stem, grab the notch, twist the handle, and now you're ready to bring it back in. Pertaining to the anchoring point of this hoist, it's located near the rear. Simply remove the cotter pin, slide the pin out a little bit, re-engage it, re-secure the cotter pin. I want to take a few moments to highlight some nice features regarding the grip hoist machine itself. The hoist can be used in virtually any orientation. And it's not just used for hoisting. It can also be used for tensioning as well as pulling. And because the hoist operates with wire rope versus its chain counterparts, it can be multi-parted to increase the capacities. We hope that you enjoyed this demonstration and found it helpful. For questions regarding the grip hoist and other products that we rent, give us a call. As a reminder, the contents of this video were for informational purposes. So I'd like to just really quickly highlight the, uh, the little logo um, for grip hoist down here on the side there. It's a, you know, it's a rigger holding rope and, and pulling it through hand over hand. That's essentially what this machine does on the interior. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you in a couple subsequent slides. Uh, this model looks a little different from some of the other ones you're gonna see. Um, to, you know, slightly different model. That's kind of the heavy duty one. Um, you'll hear these called turfers, um, rip hoist, uh, highline winch. They get called lots of names, but usually the grip hoist is, is uh, pretty universally recognized across regions. Um, so, let's so here is a grip hoist with someone went ahead and cut out part of the side casing. And you can see this top handle, this is actually the slacking handle, but you see these gears in this groove right here, the wire rope gets fed through and goes kind of between, in that uh, sheave, that groove through there and that right underneath that handle, when that gets pushed back and forth, at a certain point in that cycle, it comes down and, and kind of squishes the wire rope enough to move it along in the cycle and then goes back and does the same. So in actuality, what this is, it's a lever. So you're using a lever to concentrate the force of each crank to move that wire rope through even when it's under tension. So again, simple machines. So here, Here's, here's one, uh, here's it at work. You can see how hard these guys are cranking. Just a little play. So it's taking two of them and they've got this hooked up to a, a pulley uh, for mechanical advantage. But... So 
pretty cool stuff. Uh, they did a couple things wrong. They they shock loaded their their system and they wrapped their wire rope around a tree. Not ideal, um, but still pretty neat. So here are kind of some of the models that that you'll see out there. Um, the one that we had in that video before, that was this one, the TU-32. That is a four ton or 8,000 8, pound capacity unit. Uh, it's also almost 60 pounds. So we don't really use that one. It's not that useful. Uh, but in general, these ones on the top are more heavy duty and they're also what's called a uh, man carrying. Um, you can actually use them to, to move uh, People. I'm not sure why they're rated that way. These ones on the bottom, you'll sometimes see they're a little bit less expensive. I'm not really terribly familiar with what the main differences are, but you, you will see these once in a while. But each of them is an analog to their TU version. So you say the TU-17, TU-28 versus the 508 and the 516. They're just kind of in a different line of machines. Colloquially, what you will hear us talk about is whether we're using the one ton, which is the 2000 pound TU-17, or the two ton, which is the TU-28. So say, bring me the one ton. It's like, no, that, that wire rope's for a two ton or a one ton. Um, you'll notice they use different gauges of wire rope. So there's a 5 16th rope for the, t for the one ton, 7 16ths or just under a half inch for the uh, two ton. And again, the difference in weight is, is significant. The, Two ton is a little over twice the weight. Um, so if you have to go in deep into the forest for something, you probably want to take the one ton if you can get away with it, because otherwise whoever has to carry the two ton is going to be swearing the whole thing. Um, and is uh, Grip Hoist a uh, brand name then? It is. It's a brand name uh, of the Tractel Corporation, which I believe is French originally. There's Tractel and then Turf or which I'm not exactly sure if it's a if it's a subsidiary, but Grip Hoist is a brand name. I think there are other um, manual wire rope hoist makers, but the Grip Hoist brand is kind of ubiquitous, almost like Kleenex is for tissues. Um, I think there are some some other versions, but they pretty well dominate the market, from my understanding. Um, Hey Ben, you, yeah. you mentioned you mentioned the weight before. Um, so, in addition to the grip hoist weight, you have the weight of the cables. So, with the bigger grip hoist, you're going to use thicker cables all around. So, yeah. beyond just the grip hoist, you're going to have a lot of extra weight with the heavier cables. Heavier cables, um, although depending on what you need, and I'll get into this later. If you wind up having to use a pulley. For mechanical advantage with a one ton in order to um, in order to move something heavier, you're going to need a longer amount of wire rope. So instead of needing um, 50 feet of wire rope for a two ton, you may need 120 for a one ton in order to go out to the rock around the pulley and back. This will make more sense in a little bit. Um, but yes, yeah, so the rope is heavier. Um, as are potentially some of the um, pulleys you may need to use if you're going to take blocks with you. We call pulleys snatch blocks. Um, but yes, that is a concern. Uh, the further in you go, the, the less you want to carry things that aren't necessary. Um, so talking about the different components that usually comprise this system, every grip hoist runs with a Kind of a standard wire rope. This is actually not the type of wire rope that goes into it. This is um, what's called six by 19 wire rope, uh, whereas the grip hoist uses four by 26 strand wire rope. Not that important, but the main point is um, they use a spool that has a hook on one end and it has a naked welded end on the other, so it can actually go into the machine. Uh, if it's not welded correctly to a decent point, it won't feed into the machine. And I've had that problem in the past with fabricators not doing it right. So um, you gotta remember that it needs to be bare in order to go in. There are other cables that we use for Highline that will have 
basically uh, swaged thimble ends, just loops on each end. Um, don't want to get them confused. Uh, again, typically it's 5 16 diameter rope or 7 16 diameter rope, depending on which model of grip hoist you're using. Um, so with that in mind, it's important to use the rope that's the right size for your unit. Um, and, you know, make sure that you know what it is that you've got and that it's paired up with the correct kit. Um, in terms of treating your equipment with care and uh, not wanting to damage it, uh, the main thing is to, we want to avoid kinks, bends, and what are called bird cages, where the wires kind of start to um, peel apart and there's, you know, you, there's gaps in between them. Um, the biggest thing is to unspool and re-spool, let's see, unspool and re-spool uh, a wire rope in a very hand over hand linear fashion, straight roll. And, and none of this like winding up the, you know, the uh, extension cord or fire hose with the old like around the arm sailor trick. Uh, you need to very carefully unwind it so that it doesn't get any twists in it. Um, when I'm teaching uh, conservation core crews every year, it's one of the things I have to harp on so often because they want to be lazy and just kind of like open it up and let it spill out in loops everywhere. Um, but that's how you wind up with kinks and bends. Um, another big one is to, if you can, avoid stepping on the wire rope which seems pretty obvious, but you'd be amazed how easy it is to do if you're not paying attention. Um, if it's been a while since a, a wire rope has been used or if it's received heavy use, uh, you should give it a periodic inspection to check for any kinks and bends. Um, all of these can, uh, first and first, a kink or a bend can prevent a wire rope from actually being able to feed through the, the grip hoist machine in general, so it's unusable. But even more of concern, it can compromise the, the load rating of that wire rope so it can't bear as much of a force load. And that becomes a safety issue. So uh, another basic component are shackles. Um, you'll see these, you know, maybe on the front of someone's Jeep. They've got a, a, a shackle on the front bumper for towing, what have you. Uh, they're pretty standard. We used um, ones that have a screw pin here. So if you were to grab onto that and twist, twist with, rotate with your thumb, it should come unscrewed from this portion on the left. Uh, the other versions are too much of a pain to work with. Um, we try to use the three quarter inch size, which is the diameter of the pin, um, because they, they tend to be as versatile as we need uh, without being overly large or heavy. Uh, these weigh anywhere between a pound and a quarter to two pounds a piece, depending on what manufacturer you use. I just found out the other day that the um, Crosby versions are lighter weight and I'll probably be buying those from now on. Um, the only other real safety concern with shackles is to not side load them, as you see on the upper right-hand corner here. These are meant to withstand force uh, and the up and down orientation uh, kind of perpendicular to the pin. Um, they're not meant to be pulled, you know, pulling the horseshoe apart as it were, because they're much, they're like only about 25% as strong. And that's really the only way you're gonna break a shackle. So um, another big one is slings. Uh, you can buy these in lots of different places online. Um, and they're not all made the same. Some are better than others. Um, but there's a couple different varieties. So there's what's called I and I, which is there's loops only at the ends and it's just a straight piece of nylon webbing or a compound piece of webbing in the middle versus an, what we call an endless loop uh, where it's just sewed together, but it's just a big circle. Um, and we also have, uh, there's a distinction between what we call flat slings on the upper left, which Mainly, we, we mostly reserve those for wrapping around trees because they tend to not move around as much on trees. Um, 
versus uh, what are called round slings here on the, the, on the right-hand side and bottom. Um, tend to use those a little bit more for wrapping rocks with, but they can be used for other purposes. Um, the thickness and the diameter and lengths and, and how tough the exterior of these are, how many layers are sewn in, can vary. And that's all of those things are going to affect the um, rating for how much force they're designed to take. Um, the other thing that affects that is uh, how you use them, what sort of orientation. Each one of these you'll see should have Usually it's orange, not always, but some sort of plastic tag on it that tells you what the weight rating is for, for amount of force. And you can't read it, but there on the upper left, it says vertical, and then the middle it says choker, and then basket. And uh, there'll be a, a, a illustration with that in a second. But you see that those are different values and they're different ways of wrapping these around a rock or attaching them. Um, these have, in most cases, I think you can get it without it, but I don't know why you would, uh, red threads on the inside that basically tell you when the, uh, you've gone beyond abrading the outside edge of these and you've gone into the structural threads on the inside and compromised the integrity of the sling. So red thread means sling is dead. So you retire it and you maybe use it just for just, you know, junk work that's not, that's not dangerous. Sometimes you'll see some green warding threads. I think I see that on this here. So these are those sling hitches I talked about. So that's a vertical orientation where you're just doing one end to the other. And then that's the strongest. And then if you do it in a basket where you just wrap it around, um, looser, that's a little bit less strong. The weakest is a choker. However, the choker is the most convenient and more or less the most foolproof for, uh, you know, for wrapping rocks, for wrapping logs. But we do tend to use that uh, a disproportionate amount. You just have to keep in mind that um, the choker is going to make this as weak as it, as it can be. And the, oops, sorry. And the tighter the angle of that choke, the more it weakens it, FYI. Anything more than I think a 60 degree angle um, and it goes even below the rating that's listed on the tag. Uh, also, if you can't read that tag anymore, you have to retire that sling. Um, I would tell you to avoid Dayton brand slings because the, the labels rub off extremely fast. And it's very annoying. Uh, so when I talk about pulleys, we're back on pulleys. Actually, um, anyone have any questions yet? It's a small group, so go ahead and pipe up if you want to. All right, let's power through. So when we're talking about pulleys, what we tend to refer to are snatch blocks. The idea behind a snatch block, where that name comes from is, as you see here in the center, one side or we call one face of it can swivel and drop down and allows you to put your wire rope or in some cases regular rope in from the side rather than feed it through at the end. So you can have the rest of your system set up and then unscrew uh, you know, this, this pin that's here on your, uh, on your block and drop one face down, put your line in and then re-secure it. Now, which block you use is gonna depend on what size of wire rope are you using and what is your pulley meant to do? Are you simply redirecting the force of, of your pull at a, you know, a 30 degree angle for whatever reason? Or are you doing a 180 degree turn and coming back in order to use some sort of mechanical advantage? If your rope angle going through the pulley is less than 90 degrees, you need to make sure that the diameter of your pulley is at least 16 times your wire thickness. So if we were using a one ton wire or a one ton unit and 5 16 inch rope, that's 0.3125 times 16. That's a five inch diameter block that we would need. This one on the left, which we often use for high line, um, that is a four inch diameter. Uh, so it's too narrow. 
And the reason that's a problem is because what will happen is expecting it, a wire rope to go around that tight of a radius when it's um, that thick of a rope, it's going to deform and bend the rope. Uh, so you're going to damage it. Um, oops, sorry. This one in the center is a, it basically it's an off-road ATV block that just happens to be five inches wide, hard to find. Um, but this is what we use for our one tons when we need to have tight turns in our rope. Uh, this gigantic uh, son of a gun here, we call it the big red. Um, that is an eight inch diameter block. And when we use a two ton and have to double it over like that, that's what we use. This thing probably weighs, I don't know, 20 plus pounds easily. Um, the other concern is uh, how wide across is what's called the sheave uh, of your pulley. And you should be able to tell just by looking at it. It doesn't look like it's swimming in there. Does the wire rope look like it just gets swallowed up or is it riding on the top like an ice cream, uh, scoop of ice cream in a cone? Those mean that your, your sheave width is not correct uh, and you need to use a different pulley. Um, so the main uh, measure that we use for describing whether something is rated for the load you're going to apply to it or not is what's called working load limit or WLL. And the safety factor varies by industry, but in construction and standard materials moving, it's usually a five, five times safety factor meaning that whatever the working load limit is, is 20% of what they've established as the known minimum breaking strength. So if something has a known breaking strength of 10,000 pounds, you know that it has a working load limit under most circumstances of being 2,000 pounds. Um, uh, tree work, arboriculture is usually 10 times. And so porter wraps are rated differently. Um, it, this is one of the reasons it's important to only use rated and marked components where you know what it is that you're working with. If you have some random piece of gear and you have no idea what the rating is on it, you shouldn't use it for anything where there's safety risk. Um, and those ratings also are made using kind of ideal assumptions about that the equipment's in good shape, hasn't gotten undue wear, um, it's working properly. So for instance, if, you're, if your snatch block is rusty and it hasn't been lubricated in forever and the actual wheel doesn't spin on it, that's gonna affect you know, how that system works and what kind of load it can take. Uh, you'll hear working load limit referred to as safe working load sometimes. That it's kind of an, it's no longer a standard term in the industry, but it does get thrown around. You'll see it on some older documentation occasionally. It is interchangeable though. So the other side of this equation is, okay, we know what kind of gear we've got. Um, what is it we're trying to move? How heavy is it? And therefore how much, how strong of a system are we going to need to apply? And do we have the right gear? So, uh, Weight or mass is a function of volume times density. And density, there's, there's a, a measure for density, I don't remember, but in terms of uh, the density of the sort of granitic gneiss that we have as our stone in most of this area, it's about 180 pounds per cubic foot. Uh, we round that up to 200 just for a safety factor. Um, volume, as, we, as you might remember, is length times width times height. So if we've got a boulder here that's three foot wide by three foot tall by four feet deep, how heavy is this rock? You can put it in the chat. I would just put, put it down right there.
All right, we got some answers coming in. So yeah, a uh, couple of you got it. That is a 7,200 pound boulder. Um, so if you were to scale this down and this was two by two by two, that's only a 1,600 pound rock. So the scale up is, is exponential practically uh, in terms of boulder size. 7,200 missed a multiplier. Let's see. Three. So 36 times 200. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Um, oh, Mr. Three. Yeah. Uh, so these rocks get really heavy really fast as they grow, you know, along all three axes. So in order to move this, you would literally need to have a system that can manage to move 8,000 pounds. Um, partly because, um, I'll mention this in a bit, but you're not just moving this rock, you're moving this rock um, the weight of the rock times uh, some coefficient of friction against the ground, um, or what we would call drag. So uh, in a frictionless universe, you would need to only move 7,200 pounds, but you're probably going to have to move more than that. And also this is an estimate. It's probably slightly less than 7,200 pounds. It's probably somewhere in the 6,500 pound range, but we're estimating that just so we don't have any fun surprises. So uh, just for reference, here is a table that shows you the minimum breaking strength, um, failure factor or safety factor, and the actual rated capacity for some of these things. Um, so what's a good one? Camel block for winch rope, 8,000 pounds. Um, but it, they really do vary and whichever component of your system is the weakest link is the one you have to consider and beef up if need be. Um, so we'll get into looking at the system as a whole, um, but we can talk about basic grip point setup if you've seen it. So in rigging, you're basically leveraging force against an anchor to move something else on the other end. So what you need to do is you need to make sure that you anchor your system to something that is more stable and heavier in mass than the thing that you want to move. So you hook, uh, you know, because uh, whichever one has the least mass is gonna move when you start to tighten that rope together. So you wanna make sure that you have uh, your grip hoist set up to a significant sized healthy tree um, you know, check around, make sure it's not hollow inside. Um, make sure it doesn't have uh, widowmaker limbs up in the crown, that sort of thing, or uh, root heave around the base. Um, most of the time, if you're moving a, a, a boulder that's only a few hundred pounds, it's not much of an issue. But uh, when things start to get serious and you're moving something that's several thousand pounds, uh, you, you really do need to take that seriously. Um, as you saw in that first video, so you need to attach the hoist. The TU units are nice because they have a hook with a gate on it, so you don't need to have a shackle. Um, and as opposed to the unit that they showed in the video, the clutch or uh, the release is actually here in the back. But you know, you would push in this um, little switch here, flip the clutch up in order to push the wire rope through. Um, this sometimes can be a two person operation. Uh, if there's any tension at all on this back hook, it will prevent you from putting it into neutral. Um, just a, a tip. I see people struggle with it sometimes. Um, so once you have this set up and put in neutral, make sure you have your wire rope unspooled and you know, take a, a look at it, inspect it as you go, and then start inserting it through and pull all the slack through that you don't need um, pull it through the machine so that you don't then have to crank it through by hand once you've taken it out of neutral. 
because uh, that'll take forever. Then once you've got it hooked up to whatever your load is, be it a rock, tree, what have you, you take it out of neutral and then you can attach your handle and get ready to get ready to hoist. Um, on the other end of things, wrapping your load, wrapping a rock, uh, there's lots of different ways to wrap. Uh, you can consider, do you want to use a flat or a round sling? Or do you want to use chains? If you're doing a drag, um, we often use chains um, in order to not shred our slings so readily because they are pricey, um, but chains are heavy. So if you're working in more front country uh, and you're not on a slope where there's a risk of losing your rock and having it tumble down slope and, and become a hazard, yeah, you might consider using chains instead. Um, I'm not really covering those as much in this because they're not as common. Um, but if you have questions on that, you can hit me up. Uh, when you're wrapping your rock, uh, start to think about once you apply a pull force to it, how is that um, sling or, or wrap likely to behave? Where is it going to pull? Um, and then once the rock starts to move, how's the rock going to move? Where's the center of mass? So this rock here, this is likely, this could do one of two things. This rock could pull around 180, laying flat as it is. It kind of looks like a more of a flat disc, or it could plow in in the front here and actually flip up on end and flip over. Either way, chances are that once that this wrap in the back is no longer in the back, it's going to pull away and come off of the rock and then he'll have to rewrap it. Um, but, you know, for a start, it, it, I have no idea what Eric, Eric Mickelson, the, um, uh, the field manager um, friend of mine, what he was actually attempting to do here. So maybe this was what he wanted. Um, and if, if you know that your wrap is gonna come loose and you'll have to redo it and that's okay, then fine. Um, if losing, uh, having your wrap come off and, and having it be a matter of life and death, um, you know, if there's houses below or something, maybe you need to be a bit more conservative and wrap it up like a, uh, like a present, um, which I've done present wraps before with, you know, like you do with a ribbon um, and kind of have it on four sides. That's useful. Um, a lot of times for a lot of rocks, if they are shaped appropriately with lots of edges and crevices that can grab, a simple one uh, strap choke will do just fine and hold the entire time. But if your rock is a weird triangle shape or it's round like a potato, that can be more difficult. Um, so in terms of actually operating the grip hoist, the key thing is call and response and having people stationed as lookouts uh, to whatever extent is needed. Um, the circumstances really vary. If you're on flat ground and you're away from places where you'd expect the public to be and you don't expect to lose control of the rock, you don't really need lookouts and things like that. But in other circumstances, you may have people posted on either end of the trail, keeping people from entering into your work area because it's a busy trail and it's a Saturday. Uh, but the key is, is that the person operating the hoist with the handle works with whoever is down there at the other end with the rock. Ideally, you at least have one other person down there who is barking orders at them. So there's a call and response. They say, tension, and then the person actually running the hoist says, tensioning, so that there's everyone is on the same page as to what's happening. Because you don't want to start applying force and have rocks start moving across the landscape in a way that's gonna surprise someone. Um, so this way everyone knows that, you know, action's happening and they're paying attention. The three main uh, commands are tension, hold, and slack. The idea behind those is that they sound nothing like each other. And you can tell them from, you know, apart, even if you're 150 feet away. Um, in some conditions, if you've got other equipment going on nearby, it's an extremely windy day. If you're really far away for whatever reason, you may consider radios, um, like just little handheld walkie talkies. Um, in terms of the grip hoist operation, if you're cranking and it gets so hard to crank that you are barely able to 
budge the handle from one end to the other. Either you're really, really tired, in which case it's time to swap out, or you're maxing out the system for whatever reason. Uh, and that could just be because your load might be hung up on something. It maybe has wedged itself between two rocks and you need to free it. And that's what this person or persons here on the right are there for. I call them the shepherds because they're there with rock bars helping the load move across the ground um, and freeing it from obstructions. Uh, or it could be that you've miscalculated something about what you're trying to move. Maybe it's too heavy for your system and you need to bring in some heavier equipment to move it. Uh, the beauty of the grip hoist system, if you design it correctly, is that the weakest thing in the system is the grip hoist itself. Um, what you want is for these safety devices at the base of that crank handle called shear pins. They're these little safety pins. They're not literally safety pins, but they're these little pins that go into the handle. And once you exceed a certain amount of, uh, of torque force on that handle, it shears them in half and you can no longer tighten that system. It's a safety measure to keep you from breaking anything else that could potentially get people hurt. Uh, but when that happens, you need to stop, take the old shear pins out, put in some new ones and start over and potentially figure out where you went wrong. Um, I, I have only broken a pair, a set of shear pins once. So I actually don't remember how to replace them. Uh, each grip hoist should within the handle have a set of replacement shear pins, um, ideally. I've, I've, been, I've heard of people getting caught without them. Any questions so far? And is that rock in the picture uh, done with the uh, present uh, wrapping that you mentioned? I can't see if there's four strands going around. You no, know, I can't tell. If that, if that is a, if that's a choke, it's, it's a very loose choke um, and it's not tightening down. I'm not, I can't really tell, um, but good, good question. Um, it looks like the rock is about to uh, burst out of the, uh, the noose. It, yeah, so what's probably gonna happen here, so the, the far side of this rock is probably gonna whack up against this tree, the base of this tree, and then the entire rock is going to spin counterclockwise and then potentially pull out of the, the sling will pull off of it. Um, so again, you need to overcome the weight of the load, friction with the ground and any obstructions. Um, if need be, if you've got a couple of extra crappy rock bars that are a little bent or have blunted edges, or maybe you've got some spare lumber, especially hardwood, you can set them down as rails to uh, drag your rock across. And that can make things easier on the people doing the dragging. And it also can uh, have the added benefit of tearing the ground up less. So you have less um, impact. And you know, we try to minimize the amount of impact. Trail work by definition is, at least trail construction, is not a leave no trace activity, but we try to cut it down where we can. Um, so this, uh, this video, this drag, pretty much uh, goes through just about how you'd expect. And this is up in uh, Hudson Highlands um, on the Washburn Trail where our uh, Conservation Corps crews have been working the past couple of years. So we're doing some really, really wide steps there, four foot wide steps. But yeah, choke's not particularly tight, it's a single individual sling, but because it has those, it's very wide and it has those fairly defined edges, um, the sling has a lot to grab onto. Uh, so it's less likely to, to just slip off. If this were very smooth and didn't have those edges, it would probably come off. Um, so only thing I haven't mentioned here is if you're dragging stone or anything else across slope or especially down slope, you need to have uh, a rope belay set up to control that descent. Um, I had a crew member years ago set up a grip hoist to try and start dragging a rock down, basically just trying to drag it right down onto herself. And I was like, what are you doing? Um, in those cases, you need to be able to control that descent with the rope that's set up and anchored uh, uphill 
on a friction device like a porter wrap um, or some sort of belay device. Um, sometimes even just a shackle wrapped around a shackle a couple of times could do it in order to slow that descent. Um, we can cover belays more in a little bit. Uh, let's see. Hi, Antigone. So um, we've got a, a late arrival here. Um, so safety concerns with uh, grip voice used in dragging specifically, uh, or what's your downhill risk? If you lose control of something on a steep slope and it comes down, uh, what's the worst that can happen? What's your worst case scenario? If the worst case scenario is, oh, man, I lost my rock and we have to go find another rock, then okay, it's a bummer, but not a big deal. If you've got active trail down there or maybe uh, a water course or a wetland that you don't wanna be dropping material into, um, that's a bigger concern. Uh, the security of your wrap, um, what it, you know, how likely is it to come loose? And then same thing, what are the, what are the stakes if you do lose it? Let's pause real quick. Oh, she's not connected to audio. Um, I, Antigone, are you there? Hello? Okay, guess not. Um, so uh, another safety concern is just wire ropes under tension or even when they're not under tension, they can pose a tripping hazard or you can get clotheslined by one if you're not paying attention. If you're gonna have a system set up over a long period of time, you may want to attach uh, uh, flagging tape to it um, so that it's visible. And also just avoiding stepping on it, uh, like I said before. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, impacts to the landscape, tearing up the ground, damaging plants. Uh, if you can minimize that, do so. It's one of the reasons sometimes why we will opt for a high line system rather than dragging um, if it's sensitive ground and we've been asked to not uh, tear stuff up. Big thing I haven't mentioned, and this pertains more to pulleys, snatch blocks, is the quote unquote V of death, uh, which is worth mentioning here. Um, on this diagram below, if you look going uh, left to right from the grip hoist, these two snatch blocks, um, whenever you're putting wire rope through a pulley and it's uh, the inside of that angle is potentially a danger zone. So if you're on the inside of this angle and something were to fail under tension, say the, the hook or the, or the tree wrap, the tree sling breaks unexpectedly, that force is gonna, that block is gonna come flying in that direction at the, basically at the, the middle of that angle. So whenever possible, you, you really do not wanna be, to spend any amount of time kind of on the inside of one of those turns or one of those angles. Um, the other, the main part of this diagram is just to show you that if you can, rather than pulling straight horizontally where you're getting the maximum amount of friction with the ground, Sometimes if you can change that angle to higher up uh, in a nearby tree as kind of a way station, the angle of pull will be somewhat from, you know, it'll be somewhat up and that'll lessen the friction with the ground, uh, especially as it gets closer to the tree. The downside is, is because some of your pull is up instead of lateral, it's going to make the going slower. Oops. Um, and talking about using snatch blocks for mechanical advantage, I just wanted to uh, play this video. Oops. Uh-oh. Hold on a second. Just a second. Oh, here we go. So, other hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. It's time. Um, so, a directional is just a way to redirect force. Uh, if we want to concentrate force with pulleys, 
they need to be deployed in a specific way. And that's what this is about. So i uh, just put this on. We're not going to watch the whole thing, only about the first third. I'm for the pulley episode. These are like my favorite things in the whole world. I bought this one. It looks like it goes to a boat or something like that. Pulleys are one of these things that everybody knows about. They know that somehow a pulley will give you mechanical advantage, but people don't really understand it. We all pretend like we do, but the person that really shows up and is really clever and they arrange it in a perfect way and they just make things work, that's like the smart person that everybody wants to be. So they all smarter every day. We're going to make a video about pulleys and we're going to slowly walk through how they work and specifically i want to introduce you to my favorite type of pulley it's called a snatch block they're really fancy they can do tricks okay let's start by picking up these center blocks my kids are going to show you how to pick up blocks right if you have to pick something up you have to pick up all of the weight of the thing and whether you know it or not all of the weight of you how you doing good you can put it back down how hard was that not that bad the magic of a pulley is really the magic of a rope because a rope is always in tension you can't push a rope if you pull on this side of the rope that force transfers all the way through the pulley so you basically can redirect a force that is the primary function of a pulley redirecting force it's pretty good how was it the pulley changes the direction of your body weight. So you can use your own body weight to help you pick something up. Very good. Was that hard? Not as hard, not as hard. But not as hard as what? Just picking it up. Okay, so it's easier to pick it up with the pulley because you can kind of lean into it, right? Right. So this is the part that starts to confuse people. If you can change the way the pulleys are arranged, you can make it even easier to pick this up. Do you want the normal pulley or the snatch block? The snatch block. Snatch block. There you go. Go for it. So you split it apart. Don't cut your finger off there. There you go. So this is the magic of a snatch block. We can put a pulley in any place, anytime, as long as there's a rope and a snatch block is big enough for the rope. This is the part where when you see it happen, you're like, oh yeah, of course it's easier because of pulleys. But if you don't stop and think, you won't really understand what's happening. So slowly pull. Is it really easy this time? A lot, a lot easier okay so this is what's happening the tension in the rope right here is being redirected by this pulley because that's what pulleys do they redirect force but down here with the snatch block we're doing the same thing we're redirecting the force but you have tension in the rope and tension in the rope so all you do is you put tension in a rope somewhere and then you add up as many ropes as possible on the thing and that's how you get mechanical advantage so in this case how much force is on the center blocks? Do you know? Two. Two times the tension. I don't know about you, but I understand things a lot better if I can work with it with my hands. So I 3D printed a bunch of pulleys and snatch blocks, and we're gonna rig these things up and generate a model of how we were picking up those cinder blocks. When I pull on this rope, that tension transmits itself all the way through the rope to the very end. Wherever the rope is, there's also tension. If I pull here, think about the word pulley it pulls on the rope on the other side of the pulley right there. That pulls on the rope there at the bottom, which then pulls on the rope on the other side of that pulley, which ultimately pulls against that hook at the very end. All of the ropes are in tension. Now, if you look down there at the center block, you'll notice that there are two arrows pulling up on that pulley. That's why we get twice the force on the cinder blocks. But what if we want to pull harder? Can we just add more ropes and tension? Yes, we can using this. It's basically a double pulley. Some people call this a block and tackle. Instead of two ropes pulling down here, we get four. Just a little bit of force here. Even with my pinky finger, that's like 10 pounds of force by just barely pulling at all. This is the same number of ropes and like pulleys and everything. It's just flattened out so we can see what's going on. So I've got a scale. I'm going to attach a scale to the input of the rope and remember if we put input tension that tension goes all the way through so as I pull here I have one two three four ropes connected to the thing we're pulling so if I put two pounds here look at that I get eight pounds on the output that's awesome I'm getting four times the force but I'm only moving it one fourth as far how far do you think we can go with this? You think we can double it again? So now we have two blocks with four pulleys each, which if you count all those up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we have eight ropes in tension on that block. So as I pull here, look at this. That's nuts. That is a little bit of force 
and a lot of output. That is some serious mechanical advantage. Look at this though, the ropes over close to me are moving a lot, but the ones over near you aren't moving as much. Let's break this thing apart again and see if we can understand what's happening. This is so awesome. Oh man, that's a great shot. Okay, so here's what we got. We've got one input pulley. Let's count up the tension again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I put two pounds here on the input. Ah, oh, that is a lot of force on the output. You remember on the block and tackle, the ropes were moving at different rates. Well, think about this. On this side over here, that rope is tied up there. It's not going to move. On this side, I'm pulling the rope. It has to move as much as I pull it. And the same is true for this one because it's just redirecting that string. But after that, everything is affected by how much this moves. So just playing around with it here, you can see that these ropes move a whole lot more than that one over there that doesn't move at all. There's a lot going on here. Now, this is the sort of thing that, yes, you can probably explain it with words, but if you have a fundamental understanding of how this stuff works and you just know how to use it to your advantage, you can get yourself out of some really interesting situations. For, for example, the other day the drive... All right, so I, that basically goes on and on. and they, they play around and move some cars around and stuff, but I, I thought that was the most instructive portion. Um, before I start harping on it anymore, does anyone have any questions about that? Because this, it's one of those uh, topics that I find people get confused on fairly frequently, even if they think they have a good grasp on it. I'll, I'll come across a, a, a system that, uh, that some folks have set up and they said, oh, I've got a, um, I'm using these pulleys for mechanical advantage. I, and I'll say, well, you're using this pulley for mechanical advantage. This other one's just a directional and I have to explain it. Um, but in general, the easy thing to, to just return to over and over again is the way you know your advantage, the ratio is just like how many strands of, of rope, be it wire or fiber, are, are attached to the load you want to move. If it's not, if, if it's not attached to the, the load you want to move, it's not in the equation. So we've got a two to one here, a three to one and a four to one. Uh, and you can see like in these, so snatch block, snatch block, deadline at, at, the, at the load here. And then for a four to one, it's snatch block, snatch block, snatch block, deadline back at the anchor. Um, and to put this in context of, of what the decision-making process is, you've got that um, 8,000 pound rock we wanted to move earlier. And all you have is a one ton grip hoist and a bunch of blocks and a really long wire rope. Yes, I, that's a very good point. Wider angle means less advantage. You want to keep it as tight as possible. Thank you. Um, what's the purpose of the wedge resting on the grip hoist? I have no idea. I had to, I had to pull that off of Google. That's a PCTA photo. Um, I have no idea why that was there. Uh, so it's a good question. Um, yeah, uh, a four to one, a two to one, three to one, four to one, that assumes an exact 180 degree turn. If you're having to come back to some other anchor, maybe another tree that's 10 feet away, you are spreading out that angle and you're going to lower the mechanical advantage you achieve. Uh, but as I was saying, the point is, if all you have is a winch, a grip hoist that can move maximum 2,000 pounds of force. Um, when you hook this up with a four to one system with three blocks, uh, when you pull this, um, when you crank on this, you're still only exerting 2,000 pounds of force. But by the time it gets back completely through this system, the end result, the resulting force on this rock in the diagram is 8,000 pounds or somewhere close to it, maybe 70, 400 pounds or something like that, uh, when you uh, account for the loss of, of efficiency. Um, so it, it, it is a way for you to get, get out of some uh, um, tricky situations where maybe you don't have quite the firepower you, you think you need. You can just keep adding on ad nauseum. So that is, all I've got in terms of uh, drag and use, the use of pulleys for mechanical advantage for this, but we apply these things for Highline. I have a Highline setup 
up in Hudson Highlands that was unable to, we were lifting 1200 pound rocks in the air, uh, which is maxed out. Like it was very difficult to do. So I hooked up a two to one with a two ton uh, grip hoist in order to just make it happen. So uh, next time on the follow up to this, we can talk about things like belay lines, using grip hoist and wire rope for zip lines to move materials like dirt, uh, small rocks, things like that. And then high line systems, uh, setting them up ideally and, and operating them efficiently. Um, let me see, and here's a, actually here, if it comes up, So yeah, here's our Highline system running. If you can see this Instagram video, uh, that's one of the bigger rocks, I believe. It may, probably not the biggest. Um, we're using a tripod, which is something I can talk about because the trees on this hillside are not sufficient for the forces being used in a Highline. So we have a aluminum tripod set up. Again, roughly a 1,200 pound rock, uh, very difficult to get something like that airborne. Uh, we'll talk about the mechanics of that next time. All right, and let's see. Anyone have any questions? Yes, Ben, on the, uh, a couple of pictures ago, the diagram of the four to one uh, system for moving a rock, uh, that one, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, with two slings on a boulder like that, I noticed in the uh, video that the, uh, the block and tackle he had was uh, changing with angle from the uh, pulleys that had more pull on them to the one that was uh, stationary on the end. Would this be in danger of uh, rotating that rock around and... Uh, it's... I really, I mean, I think you really only see that because he had so many set up in that video. Mm -hmm. um, in general, yes, it, it does have a very slight kind of like corking effect. Mm -hmm. But when you're, when you're doing it, even, even a four to one, it's pretty minimal. Um, and, you know, it, again, this, uh, think of it this way, a, uh, a normal, um, a normal two-ton grip hoist moves wire rope through by itself at, in a direct drag at 2.2 inches per crank. A one-ton moves it at, uh, I think, two even or 1.8 or something like that. It's a little bit less. Um, and then for every single block you put in and you put more turns in this line, it means what you sacrifice for the mechanical advantage is, uh, is efficiency in terms of um, how, how much distance of wire rope it takes to move that rock an inch. So instead of moving that rock 2.2 inches per crank, um, you're still moving 2.2 inches of wire rope through the machine per crank, but now you're moving, uh, moving the rock a half inch per crank. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, so it is slower, um, when you set up this many blocks, it allows you to still do the work, but it slows things down. It's one of the reasons why we suck it up and, and drag the two ton out more often than, than carrying out a one ton along with a bunch of blocks. Uh, partly because the, once you have a bunch of heavy blocks, the weight savings is somewhat negligible, but also because it winds up being very slow. It takes longer to set up and then it takes longer to run the system to move, you know, a rock the 20 feet you want to move it or what have you. Make sense? Yep. Looks impressive though. I want to try it. I, I actually did. I did a four to one uh, earlier this season to, but not, not with a grip hoist. I did it with block and tackle and, and a rope. I had a 600 foot rope um, to pull a dead snag that was leaning up into other trees, kind of just leaning over a new section of trail. And rather than use the grip hoist to pull it down and potentially shock load it, which, you know, a sudden abrupt force is not something that's good for any of this equipment. So you want, you know, 
you want steady controlled force, not sharp shocks of force. So instead we just used some nylon rope and I set up block and tackle and did a four to one so that we could pull it through and just heave on it by hand. So very old school. Uh, it's worth doing at least once to just see how it works. And, and then the, the, the cable in like a four to one, uh, we don't have to worry about, uh, we, we're, we're just, we're splitting the load by four evenly across the, the full four strands of cable, right? It's not putting uh, extra load on the cable. Well, it, it, it is worth noticing. So um, on this, uh, on this last block, this sling potentially, you, you may want to you know, do the calculus of, of how much force is actually pulling on, uh, on this sling. So you've actually got a lot of force. Um, you know, you've got probably 4,000 pounds. So if you had this set up in a simple, um, a, uh, a simple choke, you may want to consider doing it a little bit differently or, um, you know, doing it as a basket arrangement or something, because you, you, it may be uh, pushing it in terms of the, um, you know, like your choke arrangement for this, it may be rated to 3,300 pounds and you're putting 4,000 on it. Um, so you may want to use a stouter or thicker uh, sling, or you may want to use chains. Chains are rated to like 12,000 pounds. But what about that lowest rope in the four to one? Uh, is that going to be carrying the uh, uh, distributed load just like the top rope? Or is it going to be carrying a little bit more load similar to that strap? This, I believe, this, this is where I get a little fuzzy. I believe this is going to be carrying 2,000 pounds of force. Um, and the, the wire rope is rated for at least that much. Um, I believe the I believe the wire rope is rated for a little bit more than the it's rated for more than the grip hoist. Um, but but I have to go back and, and look at that chart. It'll be carrying one fourth the load, no matter which one of those cables. Yeah, is. each of these cables is carrying one fourth the load. The blocks, um, the blocks are also carrying one fourth of the load. So, two thousand, two thousand. 2000, 2000. It's just split up differently. Now the shackles, each of the shackles is carrying 4,000 pounds because there's only two of them. Um, and, you know, the shackles are rated to, I believe, 9,500 pounds, if they're the ones that I described earlier. The, um, the blocks here are rated to 8,000 pounds each. So they're only, you've only got half the force. But these are the sorts of calculations that you should do when you're planning this out. Um, it's good to have a paper and pencil to diagram out the idea of a system you want to set up and then scribble the, the load ratings for the equipment you're planning to use and make sure it all checks out um, if you're going to start getting complicated like this. I try to avoid getting complicated like this in part because I don't want to do the math. <laughs> I'd rather just use a bigger winch if I can. Anyone else? All right. Um, if any of you have any other questions, um, feel free to, to hit me up at my email is bsugar at nynjtc.org. Um, and uh, I'd be more than happy to answer anything that, that comes up afterwards. Um, uh, again, I'm going to be sending some supplemental information that will flesh this stuff out a little bit and um, dig a little bit more into some of this math, if that's your thing. It's not my thing, but, um, but not by choice. I just can't do it. Uh, and, uh, Real so I'm sorry, realistically, in the six years that I've been working with the trail crew, we've never used anything more than a two to one. And when we do get a big enough rock and we're stretching the limits of two to one, I, I couldn't imagine trying to move something that much bigger 
you know, simply, oh, look at this yeah. thing. Let's, you know, use a four to one because the danger factor of losing control or final placements with rock bars and everything else exponentially gets bigger also. Yeah, usually if it's something that large, if we're trying to move it, we're trying to just maybe turn it, you know, like 40 degrees to one side to clear a space for trail, or maybe it's a rock fall that's come down that we need to just clear it off and, and remove it. Uh, we're not moving anything that large a significant distance because it's, it's just like, you know, I, I'd rather, I'd rather uh, drill and split the thing up into pieces first, uh, personally, but. Yeah, it, but it, it is nice to know what the um, the way this functions and how it's set up. Rarely do you get into anything this complicated, uh, but it, the, the theory is important to know about, uh, at least in my opinion. Ben, when do you think the next uh, follow-up class will be? As soon as I can finish the presentation, because I tell you what, I, I, I much prefer doing this in person <laughs> I'd rather just pick up the pieces and talk about them instead of having to, to create a PowerPoint. Um, it, it'll probably be a few weeks. Uh, I, I have end of season stuff to, to wrap up. Um, my guess is between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And will we get uh, an email notice about it or do we need yeah. to be checking all the time? No, I, I will instruct our, our volunteer engagement folks to specifically give you all a uh, right of first refusal in terms of signing up um, so that uh, you can follow up on it uh, as you like before I, you know, it's just so it doesn't fill up with anyone else first off. And would you run that email by me uh, one more time? Sure, it's B, B as in boy, yeah. sugar, which is my last name, mm -hmm. at nynjtc.org. Good, thanks. And uh, did you say that you were sending out some of uh, the information on the mathematics and and the yeah, diagrams I'll, I'll to it? I'll um, I'll send you guys information that'll be it'll probably be two or three things that you may find interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just ask our volunteer engagement folks to send that along with the you know the follow up email um, in the next day or two. Great, thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks, Tom. This is good. Yeah, had to do it. All right. Um, hey, ben? Yeah. You had the one video of them flying a rock on the high line. And there were a couple of things on there that, you know, as you were talking about this and safety that I've come to be very aware of. Um, on your commands, I didn't see anything that said rock on the line. And I know yeah. that's more of a high line thing. That's typically a high line thing. And yeah. unless you really are um, in, a, in a very dangerous situation with a drag, uh, that I don't think that video, I mean, that video was sped up. So there, were no sound, there was no sound. Um, I, I do instruct rock on the line and clear as additional commands for high line. I just didn't want to get into that. Okay. All right. Okay, well, if there's nothing else, I'm going to go and try to eat a